Well, welcome everybody. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I know a lot of you, but uh, there's also a lot of you I don't know. So I'm, I'm Doug Shipman, director of Windsor Historical Society. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's virtual program uh, called Why Now? Museums, Race, and the Road to Inclusion with Jamal Jimerson, who on my screen anyway is right next to me. I don't know where he is on your screen in the checkerboard squares, but he'll be coming on in just a second. Uh, so this is the third in our series of four virtual programs this winter. Uh, the first two of our programs, for those of you that participated, you know, they featured uh, Windsor and Connecticut history uh, in very specific ways. And the second of the two programs are really intended to help us examine how we do history, how we prioritize our work to be more inclusive, uh, strategies that can help us to achieve this. So tonight is Jamal Jimerson, uh, and uh, in just a few weeks, we'll have Fiona Vernal uh, talking with us as well about doing history more inclusively. So while we recognize that some degree, uh, these topics might have greater to appeal to people who run museums, uh, board members, staff members, and so on, and I know we have some museum people on with us tonight, uh, we also felt it was really important uh, as part of our own inclusion action plan to help our broader membership and general public understand why we at Windsor Historical Society have made becoming a more inclusive organization our top priority for the beginning of our second century. And so uh, now we are very pleased to have with us this evening a person that uh, I'm honored to have known for a number of years, uh, beginning way back when he was one of the senior leaders with the Greater Hartford YWCA uh, today, Jamal Jimerson is owner and CEO of both Thought Partner Solutions, where he leads a small team of consultants and educators in anti-racism work, and is also the founder and executive director of the Minority Inclusion Project, a nonprofit organization devoted to helping the nonprofit sector close the racial leadership and governance gap. One of uh, Minority Inclusion Project's flagship programs is the Board Diversity Initiative. And that's a program that we here at Windsor Historical Society are proud to say we completed back in the fall uh, and have now developed our own inclusion action plan as a result of our participation in that program. So some of the people that helped with that are on the program tonight. I won't call you all out, but thanks for being here. In addition to a long career in nonprofit leadership, Jamal holds a Master of Science degree in Human Services with a concentration in the management of nonprofit agencies, a Master of Arts in Business Communications uh, with a concentration in Leadership and Influence, and a BA in Mass Communication, where he concentrated on understanding the role of communication and fostering interaction and interdependence across gender, race, and culture. So Jamal knows what he's talking about not just from all the academic training, but from a lot of direct experience. He's provided training sessions and made presentations and keynotes on equity, diversity, and inclusive leadership at numerous workshops, regional and national conferences, nonprofits, colleges, and businesses uh, that combine research, personal stories, and his professional experience. We're very pleased to have Jamal with us today to talk about why it is now more than ever so urgent that museums like Windsor Historical Society become more diverse, inclusive, and equitable organizations. And so without further ado, I'll ask Jamal to unmute himself and take it away. Thank you, Doug, I appreciate it, I appreciate it. Good evening, everyone, good evening, good evening. Um, I see some familiar faces, thank you for the waves, I appreciate that. Um, I, I decided um, in approaching this conversation tonight that I wanted it to feel more like a meaningful discussion than a lecture. So I've, I've spent the day today, for example, doing presentations for folks, and I really wanted to speak with you tonight and, and kind of share my insights and thoughts. And then I wanna invite you in for some questions, for some Q&A a little bit later. Um, I'll start by giving you a little bit of, of like my background and my work up to getting here, because you've heard some of my uh, professional accolades, which, which I'm honored that you could hear about, but I'd love to tell you a little bit more about like my personal journey, um, because my personal journey played such a huge role in defining what made me decide to uh, focus my life on racial equity work. Um, I was uh, actually born in Newark, raised in New York, uh, in, in Brooklyn and Queens. 
Um, I grew up in a family that was um, pretty low to middle income. Um, so we had some, some, some struggles. And I, I, I share this openly with folks all the time that I grew up in, in the 80s and 90s. I'm 41. Um, during the time that I grew up, uh, the 80s, that we were really uh, ravaged with the, with the crack epidemic. And frankly, my family, um, I was said in our neighborhoods, we had folks that sold crack and folks that, that used it. And um, my family were the users, unfortunately. So I, I grew up seeing a lot of drug use, um, being exposed to a lot of violence. But I think from a young age, I had a sort of, um, for one, I was forced to be a little bit more mature than I probably uh, should have been at that age. And two, um, I think one of the things that I, I spent a lot of time learning about as a child was that my experience as a young man was really um, heavily um, centered on my identity as a young black kid. And my mother would tell me stories about her growing up in Queens. And one story that stands out, for example, is having been chased from John Adams High School by a, a small mob of white kids who were screaming out the N-words at her and they literally chased her and her brothers home from school. And she's, you know, she was born in the 50s. She graduated high school in the 70s. And um, those were the things that defined her experience. So, so much of what I heard coming up from her was, um, was shaping my sort of understanding of my racial identity. I think the other thing that shaped my racial identity coming up, folks, was that, um, you know, the 80s and 90s in New York were, were sort of a racial hotbed. Um, and I was a kid, so I'm watching the news and I'm hearing all of these, these stories. And I just, I share that because some of these stories left some deep, deep impressions on, on my spirit. Like literally, I, I could name people that I've never met, um, but for some reason I know their story because they were a victim of racial violence. I, can, I remember being uh, six years old, for example, when 66 year old Eleanor Bumpers was uh, shot by a police officer point blank range. Uh, be, you know, she had a mental illness and I guess they walked into her apartment and, you know, they just killed her. And this was when I was six. And when you grow up with those types of stories, they kind of don't leave you. Um, I was 11 years old when or 12 actually when um, a young man by the name of Gavin Cato, um, a young black kid was, was mowed down on Eastern Parkway. Uh, him and his cousin Angela were hit by a car and uh, the folks who hit them when the ambulance arrived, the, 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 the couple that hit them were escorted from that vehicle and they left those two little kids under that car. And uh, the, of course the young man passed away and this resulted in the community having an uprising and, and it led to what we knew as the Crown Heights riots. And I was 12 years old when that happened. I was also 12 when, when the Rodney King incident happened and um, the uh, neighborhood that I was in literally shut down because they were afraid that our neighborhood would riot um, as a result of Rodney King. Um, I was eight years old when Yousef Hawkins was killed for uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, walking through a white neighborhood. And he was uh, in a case of mistaken identity. They thought that he had come there with his two other black friends to, uh, to apparently date a girl in the area. And they decided to, um, to shoot him and kill him. And these stories stayed with me when I was young and they really informed my consciousness. And they didn't so much anger me as, as much as they did make me want to figure out ways at that time I was focused on how could I help um, empower, particularly people of color, black people and, and specifically to be able to um, move beyond some of these issues. And I didn't know what else to think when I was a kid. So subsequently, you know, I, I stayed sort of active um, in, in, in civil rights issues, uh, ended up in college at the University of Bridgeport, which is what brought me to Connecticut. And while in Connecticut, I got connected in with some community programs. I didn't know I was going to end up uh, falling in love with, with Bridgeport and uh, ended up staying up in, in the Bridgeport area and doing some really great work in the community out there. But all throughout my journey, I continued to stay connected in with folks that were trying to either lift um, uh, the consciousness of Black folk and, and connect them to resources they need or trying to deliberately call out and stop 
uh, you know, racist policies and practices from happening that were uh, disproportionately affecting black families and communities. So that's pretty much been the bulk of my journey. And, um, you know, I can tell you that, you know, I, I did another, I had another conversation several months ago with uh, the New England Museum Association where we, where they asked me to speak on this topic there. And what's interesting is that I had shared with them that growing up, I, um, I didn't really go to museums much. It wasn't, it wasn't the thing to go to, um, that I had a disconnect from the arts and culture scene. When I, when I was an adult, when I was in my twenties, I started going and, and participating in some arts and culture stuff. But even then I didn't really go to museums. And when I did go, um, I would go to museums that uh, were exhibiting cultural displays, you know, things that were about African-American culture, about black culture, about black music, because I was curious to know more. And when I play it back, when I, when I think back and I'm, you know, kind of hindsight is 2020, I think what drew me to those particular types of museums is that I remember being in public school and never feeling like I got the full story on my own history, right? Like I didn't, I didn't learn much about my people. I didn't know much about where we were from. I didn't understand much. And the way the stories were being told to us in school, it was, there was, you know, you were in Africa and then you came here as slaves. And then your whole story is rooted in resistance from, <laughs> from the time you got here to trying to overcome enslavement to eventually dealing with more racism. And you did some great inventions along the way. And now you're here. And that's, that's the summary of it. And so that leaves you as a, as a young black person sort of uh, feeling empty and wanting to connect the dots, wanting to know more about the story. But the interesting thing was, I still wasn't really attracted to the museum scene because frankly, I didn't see or, or feel that there was any, any exhibit that was still gonna be about me. And when I did go to museums that did have exhibits that were, that were kind of culturally focused or focused on black Americans, it drew me in. Uh, one of my first was going to Philadelphia uh, to the African American Museum on Art Street. And I appreciated going there because the first exhibit that I went to uh, was a heritage display. And they were just talking about different cultures and different type of hair textures. And I, I learned things there that I never knew. And then I went back another time to the same museum and they had a, a display that was purely about quilting and how, and how important quilting was to, uh, to the history of black people and frankly how quilting was used to uh, help enslaved um, people to find trails or find pathways out of oppression. I thought that was powerful um, to hear that story. So I connected with that. Um, and I connected with the opportunity to, to fill in the dots to learn more about who I was. I went back for a third time to that same museum when they had a, um, an exhibit about uh, Malcolm X that I was curious about. And, and, I, and I thought that was interesting and he, among some other things they had there. And then another time after that, I went to the Schomburg in Harlem and, uh, and, and, and visited that museum. And they had another display on Malcolm X and some other folks and I thought that was powerful. And, and once again, I found myself going to places so that I could get the full scope of the story. So I wanna just continue reinforcing that is that um, what attracted me as a person of color to museums, to arts and culture were the things that talked about my story, that extended, that gave, that gave details about who I was and what my past was. And, um, you know, they say, you can't know where you're going until you know where you come from. And when your history is kind of not being talked about in school and other places, you're looking for those opportunities to learn more. So I found myself really being drawn to the museum scene as I got older because they would offer those opportunities. And then subsequently a few years ago, I had a chance to, I'm hearing an echo for some reason, someone's uh, mic is on double or something. But a few years ago, I had a chance to go to the African-American, the National Museum of African-American History in Washington, DC. And I can tell you that that experience was uh, literally, um, it was amazing. It, it, it was, it was, it was so eye opening. And, and one of the things I went into that museum and I was sort of skeptical about, uh, what they would show. I, I, I didn't want to walk into a museum that was all about the same things I had learned about in school, you know, okay, you were slaves and then you had to fight against, uh, more oppression. And then, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to see more of that. 
And I was pleasantly pleased to go in and have so many uh, details, so much, so much rich detail about historical figures, past and present. So current rele relevant folks in, in modern culture, as well as people from the past, with stories being told about their journeys, um, the, the, the cultural artifacts that, that uh, the museum got a hold of to kind of highlight, for example, seeing, uh, sorry, I'm getting an echo again. I don't know where that's coming from, but historical artifacts like Whitney Houston's uh, Grammy dress when she, when she sang, uh, um, what, what's the big song that she sings? I, the, I know that, that one song, I'll, I'll Always Love You. And she was at the, the Grammys and she had this beautiful red dress on. And yeah, so they had that dress there on Michael Jackson's jacket and something that simple did something for me because again, in mainstream culture, it feels like those things are not as valued or appreciated. Um, and one part I did skip is that is that another museum that I had gone to even before they opened up the NEMA, which is the National Museum of African-American History, was when the Smithsonian, some years before that, had a, a section devoted to um, the African-American history component. This is prior to the big museum opening, um, which is also a Smithsonian Museum. But listen, I had an amazing experience there. And I had a group of kids with me. And I literally, I'm in the Smithsonian, and we spent all of our time in that section. And I had a group of young people. And I walked them from exhibit to exhibit. And I saw things like the, uh, the shackles that were used to, to chain enslaved people and the stories behind those things. I saw, uh, you know, drums that were used. I saw all types of artifacts, books that folks, journals that they wrote in, and it connected with me. It connected with me in a deep way. So I, I share all that with you because uh, what most people would say, oh, I mean, it's just a visit. For me, it was a powerful, moving opportunity to connect with something that had some element of my story. And I've been a person, I think, throughout the course of my life I've always wanted to know more about my identity and to have museums play the role of helping me to paint the picture of illustrate or fill in the dots or get to understand more about my identity. Uh, that was really powerful to me. So I think that when we talk about museums, race and the road to inclusion, it's important to, to contextualize that when I, when, I, when I talk to groups who say we have a lack of, uh, you know, client or patron diversity. Um, we uh, can't seem to get people of color to serve on our boards. We can't seem to get people of color to come in and see the exhibits. The first thing I tell them is that the, the, uh, the exhibits need to be reflective of the people that you're trying to bring in. Like you've got to feel connected to it. And, and not just in you know, Black History Month or just this one special exhibit, but really making my story and the story of so many other millions of people in this country a part of the mainstream experience. That I shouldn't necessarily have to go to uh, a museum that's, that's singularly focused on my history to get some element of my history in other spaces. So I share that all the time with folks. But I think that what's happened is over the years that and this is what I've seen, not just with museums, but with other in industries, is that we've we've kind of been complacent and we've allowed a lot of things to kind of happen. And this, this quiet separation that's existed, this quiet um, sort of disregard for inclusion um, has been harmful. And I don't think it was about intent either. I don't think that folks intended to be uh, exclusionary and I don't think they intended to, to be uh, you know, quote unquote racist or anything else, I do believe that the, the impact was exclusionary and the impact was racist. And what that ended up doing was it, it left a lot of people who have a story to tell and have, have valuable histories, it left us out of the mainstream discussion. And so in speaking to the museum group several months ago and talking to this group now, I really do think that the reason why now is the time is because you play a very critical role in helping to tell the whole story. You are the authority, you have the ability, and I say authority in that as, a, as someone who's a visitor, <laughs> that I see museums as an authority. And that your choice of exhibitions and the words that are used 
uh, to describe moments in history or the meanings of certain cultural artifacts and objects, they matter. And when those things are done without regard for diverse communities, it's harmful and it keeps us out of, out of attending. And so I do think now is the time to tell the story. I'm also looking at our current climate. So I said, I grew up in the eighties and the nineties where, you know, I grew up in sort of a racial hotbed, but it was still kind of contained. Well, now we're at a point where we went from, uh, you know, early nineties having one camcorder tape Rodney King get essentially uh, jumped by seven or eight different officers to now everyone has a camera and they're pulling them out and they're using the cameras to do what? To tell the story. They're using cameras to provide substance for the narrative to once again show what's happening in our society. And because they're using these cameras, we're seeing firsthand the atrocities that are occurring. And frankly, I think the George Floyd incident of last June was just literally the most eye-opening moment that I've come across in my short time on this earth that it seemed as though people who had otherwise been complacent or sort of blinded to the complexity, the nuance, the challenge of racism in this country were suddenly introduced to, yeah, it's here, it hasn't gone anywhere. And, and some would argue it's, it's, it's worse because it's been sort of hidden for so long and that we've been, we've been ignoring the, the endemic nature of it, that it's been normalized. And so here we are in this critical moment where because we're able to see these things on camera, the conversation starts to brew up. And now we're talking openly and honestly about stories. We're talking about whose story is missing, who's not at the table. And post George Floyd, as a consultant, I was inundated with lots and lots of requests for support from organizations who are, who are opening their eyes and going, we want to do something about this now. And the reality of it is that I'm happy to see that eyes are opening, but I want us to recognize that with opening your eyes, there needs to be an acknowledgement of the sense of urgency to, to catch up finally, to, to really stay with the times. And especially museums, I want you to, to have a relevant stand, a point, a leadership role in this, in this current movement. And I think there's an opportunity for that. Uh, we see across the country that folks are trying to correct elements of history by taking down monuments, by, by pulling down flags, by uh, challenging old traditional racist stories and narratives, by calling out uh, text, books, um, uh, cartoons, illustrations, things that we've, we've had in our society that have historically shared the narrative from a monocultural standpoint. And now that we're accepting that, yeah, we have this multicultural issue and everyone needs a voice, well, now we're challenging those traditional narratives. So the museum is in this unique position to take a stance and take a role in this. And I don't think, you know, I, I spoke to a group several years ago where that question came up of, you know, well, they're trying to get rid of history. Are we okay with that? And my answer to them was, it's not that the museum should be okay with them getting rid of history, that the museum needs to play a critical role in helping to ensure that the entire story is being told. You are, are in a position that I think is really important, that there's an incredible amount of value in the education that comes from museums and historical societies and other arts and culture programs to really be able to put a full a scope on things, to tell the full story. So I, for one, for example, am not necessarily a fan of the removal of, of statues. I'm more of a fan of telling the whole story about the statue, right? And making sure that there's an understanding of why it's problematic to specific communities that we are honoring certain folks as heroes when in fact to many other communities, they were, they were nightmares, they were, they were enemies, they were villains. And you've got to tell the story as whole as you can. And, and not to, you know, I think it's, it's important to recognize this is not about good versus evil. There is a complexity in the human experience that says good people do bad things, that good people make bad decisions, that when we normalize uh, racism and we act as though it's not problematic, that even the most well-intentioned, well-meaning people that we love and trust participate in racist acts. 
But I'm not focused on the individual racist. I'm talking about the system that backs that. And ultimately, what we want to do is be able to address if we know that that type of issue is there, why is it happening? We need to look at the root cause of those problems. And we need to give voice to people who are saying we want the full story told. And that's the role that museums have a unique position to play. Um, I think it's, 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 a, it's the responsible way to go. So I think that museums have to find new ways to talk about the histories and identities that surround your exhibits. Um, and you need to invite in uh, people um, and invite in their interest, invite in our story. I'll tell you one of the things that I saw at the NEMA that was really powerful was they had a section where they, they did, a, of course they had Whitney Houston and other contemporary artists, but they also throughout the museum, they highlighted hip hop culture. Hip hop culture is, as important to the Black American experience as jazz, as R&B, right, as rhythm and blues, um, as rock and roll, and it was it was nice to see the validation at a national level to say yes, hip hop, with all of its 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 good and bad points, is a part of the story of the Black American experience. So we're going to allow ourselves to embrace the elements of that story, and they. They put up artifacts from hip hop culture and had stories and honored certain artists. And it was really nice to see that. Again, because the goal here is to tell the, all, the, the full story, right? The other thing is that, you know, when we do not challenge the mainstream narratives, we're actually participating and perpetuating and upholding racist viewpoints, okay? So, so, Oftentimes, it's the minority viewpoint that's challenging those points of view. Um, the majority is saying, no, there's nothing wrong with this. We need to allow ourselves to, to, to challenge the narrative by offering perspective from the other side. What is the experience of people outside of us? I'll tell you that so much of the work I do on racial equity um, is, is, is really centered on people who have no real idea about how damaging some of their actions are or how damaging some of their ideology is or how damaging some of the policies and laws that they support are to people other than themselves. And this is why I say that it's very important to, to look at things holistically because if you begin to listen to the full narrative or the full scope of an issue and begin to ask who is impacted by things, you start to learn that, wow, maybe I could have made a different choice if I knew that I was injuring or hurting all these people in the process. We don't focus on the, the racist. And I, you know, I have a, 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 one of my slides on my graphics, I have Bill Clinton, right? And I have on one side that he's both a racist and on the other side I have anti-racist. Because the premise of that is that you can be a racist one minute and the next minute be an anti-racist based on the choices that you make, literally in the moment. So if I focus on the individual and I just focus on writing them off or attaching a disposition to that individual, I've lost my way. I'd rather focus on the impact of the decisions that are made. And in the museum space, I think the, the point that I'm getting at is that you have the ability to make decisions, choices that are going to be more anti-racist than racist. And part of your anti-racist agenda should be to invite in the full perspective on your exhibits to tell the stories about those whose story is otherwise untold um, and to ensure that, that we're being fair um, in, in order to bring, uh, value to humanity, right? That there are all these people in our spaces. Um, you know, you're a historical society, you're in a community that may be primarily white, but there's still a, uh, a minority population in that community that has a story. Are you telling their story? Do they see themselves in your historical society? Is there any way that you can incorporate their narrative? What are their perspectives on the people you call heroes that you are highlighting or the stories that you're telling? Are you telling the full story? And the, this is the work to me, the complex work that museums can take a role in. So yes, the time is now. And yes, I also believe that museums 
are uniquely positioned to be leaders in this in this fight to improve the quality of education. We know in in the K twelve arena they are working hard to improve uh, you know pedagogy to ensure that uh, we have more curriculum that's in place to address and call out some of these racial issues and talk about the history in a more thorough way. But I think. Um, that plus, so like a both end, that plus the role that museums can play is really critical. So that's the external component. Now, internally, within your institutions, I'm also going to push you to think this way. Um, within your institutions, I think that every person in your organization and your institution needs to be uh, well trained in racial equity and anti racism. If that's not something that you've done already, it's important that you put that on your agenda. It's part of how you'll understand how to better operate your internal systems. I think that you want to try to attract people of color to come work for your organizations, for your institutions. And part of that is going to be in adopting a racial equity framework internally, um, committing to things like pay equity and a living wage, giving all of the employees in the organization a voice, ensuring that they see themselves uh, uh, really reflected in leadership and on the boards. So as you're recruiting board members, these are things you're thinking about. So you have this internal work that needs to be done. You also have external work that can be done. But let, let's let's go a little bit further. If you're going to, to do meaningful racial equity work, what does that look like? How does that manifest itself? And uh, one of the things that I, I created last year um, and rolled out shortly after the George Floyd incident is a racial equity model called REACT. It's a framework. And it's an acronym for racial equity, acknowledgement, commitment, and transformation. And I designed that framework because the we went from sort of folks not understanding what was going on to everyone sees something that's going on and now they're going, what do we do about it? And so the REACT model is a response. It's an opportunity for you to really allow for your organization to go through a full scale racial equity process. And whether you follow specifically the tenets of REACT or you do it another way, it is important that the components of this type of framework are incorporated in any change model that you're part of. So for example, first and foremost, the A stands for acknowledgement. And what do I mean by that? I mean the ability to acknowledge the way racism shows up within our institutions within our structures, within our communities, and how even the very exclusion of minority voices in the development of our exhibits or in the telling of their stories is a form of racial exclusion, racism, of inequity. And we have to call that out. The acknowledgement that you know the museum, uh, museums don't exist in a vacuum, that you exist in a larger society that's dealing with structural and systemic racism, but as an institution, you too may be very well perpetuating racism. You likely are. And that's not an attack again on individuals, that's about looking at the institutional practice. What are we doing as an institution that we need to acknowledge in order to move ourselves forward? So acknowledgement is a key piece. Acknowledgement is about getting to the root cause of a problem. It's about seeing that there is when we first um, more to more to uh, the resolution to a problem than just a quick, simple answer. Um, Acknowledgement goes deep. I'll tell you where that came from. Uh, you know, people go to marriage counseling all the time, right? For like all kinds of relationship issues. And what do they tell you when you go in there that you've got to listen, um, and you've got to start learning how to how to acknowledge, right? How to validate, how to recognize the perspective of someone outside of yourself. The hardest thing to do sometimes is to do that. So in that acknowledgement work, what you're doing is you're doing some listening. You're learning from people other than yourself. You're gaining some new perspective. You know, how do you begin to challenge unchallenged ideas or unexamined ideas if you've never even thought the idea was an issue in the first place? So you've got to listen to people that are going to give you some perspective. And frankly, here's the challenge for, for most of the folks who are doing the listening is to do it without being defensive. Because oftentimes we want to, because of the way we've been socialized to believe our story is the truth, we want to defend our position. Let me give you an example. So I've worked with groups that have had literal debates over whether Santa Claus is white. 
And the idea of Santa Claus, a fictional character being white, right, was so important to some people because his whiteness lent itself to a level of purity that they didn't want to remotely give up. And they had grown up with this image of the white Santa Claus, that the very idea that someone could introduce the, the concept that maybe Santa Claus is Asian, that <laughs> maybe Santa Claus is Black, why can't he be? seem to create a big disruption. And, and for me, it's I'm less focused on judging one way or the other, but I am interested in going deep and saying, why is that a point of disruption? Why are we fighting over the, the racial identity of a fictional character? And if we're fighting over the racial identity of a fictional magical being, then imagine how much we fight over the things that are real. <laughs> And how much we're trying to hold on to the things that are real within the same social construct. Um, acknowledgement forces us to have those really thick and difficult conversations. Sometimes the things that we acknowledge in our conversations are not just purely about race. Sometimes we're talking about the cultures of our organizations and we're discussing the way in which there are certain facets or certain uh, um, aspects of our culture that are just um, you know, conflict averse, or they're too polite. And so they won't talk about complex issues. They won't confront difficult subjects. Or, or they don't want to offend the people who have been a part of the in-group whose story has been told all along. They don't want to offend them. So they, they try to dance around the issues. And so again, the work with a group like that is to get them to a place where they can really unpack the why behind that. Why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult? There's so much in the acknowledgement phase alone that oftentimes I advise groups that want to be a part of advancing inclusion and diversity and equity work that before you get to doing anything, the first thing you need to do is the acknowledgement work. Just step back and sit in that work for a minute. And the discomfort of the acknowledgement work is that, and when we use the Santa example, is that you grow up with a socialized understanding of who Santa is. Every picture, every movie, every magazine has shown all of us there's one way to see Santa Claus. So the nerve of someone to say, mm -mm, that doesn't fit. Or look at the recent issue with Dr. Seuss. Now, in that case, their company made the decision to pull those books off the shelf because they realized there were racial undertones. They made that realization on their own and they pulled the books. And that upset a lot of people. People who had grown up feeling like Dr. Seuss was just harmless. He was harmless for the in-group. He was harmless for some, he was not harmless for all. So I commend them on making the decision to do what was best for, for, for everyone else. Sometimes that minority voice that's been muted needs to feel like they matter enough that we're willing to do that. So acknowledgement is tough work, it's difficult work, but it is important work. And I want folks to recognize that that is something that you need to do. And the second piece is commitment. The C stands for commitment. And commitment is really where you get to a place where you're saying we are, we are invested in ensuring that um, real change happens, that we're making not only verbal statements of commitment as a museum, as a historical society, but we are also going to do some meaningful work to, to change things. We're gonna to respond to some of these difficult points that we've had to now acknowledge. In order to effectively do commitment work, it begins with an audit. You have to do a comprehensive review of your policies and your procedures. I met with a group today when I mentioned that they need to look at whether or not their policies and practices are discriminatory. The HR person said, there's nothing that we do here that's discriminatory. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm not saying there is, but uh, let's talk about the data for a moment. Tell me about the makeup of your leadership team, all white. Tell me about the makeup of your staff, primarily white. So have you looked at at any point whether or not your, your process, your practice or your policies are exclusionary in any way, shape, or form. And when I said that to her, she said, I never thought about it that way. The idea of being able to look at the facts, to do a comprehensive review of those facts, 
and to acknowledge as well as say we're going to commit to, to doing something about it. The second piece of, of commitment is about committing yourself to a process that brings new employees of color um, on board into your museums. I think that the museum industry in particular has to think about how do you bring in people of color to work for your uh, arts and culture organizations. And so much of that systemically is about building pipelines early. Um, I've, I've worked with programs in Bridgeport that had like those student docent programs where they would teach students how to, how to be tour guides in museum. And I thought those programs were, were meaningful for those particular students. We should see more of that. Opportunities to take kids and bring them into those spaces so they can learn. But the reality of it is really planting yourselves early in a systemic discussion about building a, uh, a racially diverse employee pipeline, as well as a racially diverse a visitor or patron pipeline, very important. And, and ensuring that you do that. And some of that work for museums is not about people always coming in. Some of it will require you to go out. So let me stress this to you is that your exhibits are in, but as long as you can step out, I would encourage you to go into pockets of the community that are oftentimes overlooked and do some outreach and some relationship building and ask them what they'd like to see and invite them into your uh, spaces and get to know them. I, you know, so much of this work is about relationships and the way when we're in relationship, we are responsive, but when we are not in relationship, we oftentimes are neglectful. Um, we are oftentimes overlooking the needs of folks when we're not in relationship with them. So I wanna encourage that. The next piece is what I call PowerPoint mapping. And specifically points in which you are making decisions about exhibits, about who you hire, about the type of outreach you're going to do, whatever decisions you're making at different points in that process, someone has to decide. And what you want to do is identify the decision points and you want to ask yourself, are you making decisions that include all? And the only way you can make inclusive decisions that invite everyone in is to stop at those decision points and really bring others in to help you to make those decisions. So for example, in the hiring process, what I tell people is, you know, when it comes to identifying candidates that you'll bring in for just for interviews, forget, forget whether or not they actually make it through the process, who's helping to decide when you're screening resumes, whether or not these candidates should get a call back or not. There are studies that have been done on implicit bias that say people with white sounding names are 50% more likely to get a call back from having their resume viewed than a person with a black sounding name. 50% more likely, not because of qualifications, but on the basis of the name alone, that they're 50% more likely to get a call back. So how do you stop that in the decision point matrix? Well, you have a, a, a diverse, panel of folks that can review those resumes. So you can minimize the likelihood that our bias will stop a good candidate from being able to come in the door. And that's just the HR component. When we start thinking about how do we do community outreach and programs, right? You shouldn't make those decisions in a vacuum. You should invite in some uh, folks that have different uh, social identities, whether it's by race or gender or sexual orientation or socioeconomic status or educational levels, whatever it is, and bring them in to help make some of those decisions. Now, um, I know that that's not always easy work because it begins with building relationships, but that's the point. And we wanna to continue to allow that to happen. Number four is um, always use, and I just mentioned this, diverse screening and hiring panels, find qualified candidates of all races. I'm gonna reinforce this to you that you really want to ensure that you are building up a workforce. We need to see more people of color in positions of leadership in these spaces, and we need to invite them in to be um, a part of these museum teams and other other teams. We can't attract people to something where no one looks like them and is and you know expect them to come in. And then a, number five, I would say, is that every decision that you make um, at any level needs to be vetted 
through what we call a racial equity impact assessment. You have to be able to look at things and the simple truth of it is just ask yourself the question is, are we doing enough? Uh, are we appealing to all communities? Is anyone missing? Some of those critical questions that matter. Um, I, wanna, I wanna make a few more points and then we're gonna go into Q and A. Um, the final piece is the transformation component and what transformation looks like. And transformation is when you begin to put in elements in your system that shift people um, and shift them away from what they've always done to something totally brand new. And in order to have effective transformation, you need transformational leaders. You need people that are fearless, that are willing to, not even so much fearless, but, but courageous enough to walk toward fear to embrace the fact that fear is a component of all of our journeys as leaders, but that you're really gonna embrace the fear, embrace the idea that you could fail at something, but you're willing to do it in order to do what's right. Uh, you also need folks that have, that are inspiring. I would say that, you know, you need some, some judge, some personality, some, some, some folks that got a little bit of sizzle in them to attract people to the space, but also to inspire folks who work in the space to do more and do better. And finally, I would say uh, a real component of, of, of transformative leadership in this is heart. You need plenty of heart. You need to be connected with why you are doing this. It needs to be authentic. You have to have some self-interest in this and stay committed and stay focused in that realm. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure that when you're up against challenges and resistance and failure, that if you can lean back on why you got into this in the first place, that it'll bring you through. And so there's so much there that I just mentioned, but that's really the heart and soul of the React model. I wanna close by saying this in, in, these, in these sort of opening remarks is that not only is the time now, but whether we have another George Floyd tomorrow, God forbid, hopefully we don't, the time will still be tomorrow. Uh, the time was yesterday. We need everyone to stop um, ignoring, um, whether consciously or, or unintentionally, the, uh, the deep levels of systemic issues that exist and we need folks to step up and, and do something about it. And frankly, I wanna reinforce that your, your sector specifically, your subsector, the arts and culture sector, museum specifically, can lead this work. You can be instrumental in ensuring that stories are being told, that narratives are being shared, and that we're putting full color and context uh, to who we are as people. As long as we continue to only tell the stories one way, we're doing more harm than good. So I'll stop right there with my remarks. It's 7.53. I want to give folks a chance to lean in so we can begin our discussion in our Q&A. And I would encourage you, uh, please open up and ask questions about specific things that you're dealing with. If I can answer them, I surely will try. Um, but also feel free to share your thoughts and your commentary about some of what I've already put out today. So we can open it up from here. Awesome, Jamal. Thank you. And uh, sure. I, I didn't see uh, I didn't see any uh, comments or questions in the chat. And I was going to call on Jeanette Isaac, but it looks like she stepped away for a sec. So she had her hand up like within thirty seconds of Jamal starting. So I was going to honor that with calling on her first. Uh, but we'll we'll get her when she comes back. I just wanted to say, Jamal, first, thank you. Uh, and the things that you've talked about while we're really talking about arts and culture institutions today. Uh, really apply to any institution that you're part of, right? So some of you here are leaders in your uh, religious organization or in a different kind of organization, maybe even at work uh, as an employee somewhere. And these same principles apply no matter where you are. So it's, it's great general perspective in, in going through your lives in, as members of an organization where you're the, whether you are the top leader or uh, leading from where you are, uh, which is uh, also very important for all of us to do. So uh, let's open it up for Q&A. Just you can raise your hand. I see Debbie, you were the first. So I'm going to call on you. Thank you. Hi, Jamal. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Shipman. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have struggled with 
the change that's coming for historical um, statues and monuments that you talked about. And one of the things I was hoping is that they're not destroyed because in as much as they don't tell the whole story, I think there is room for museums to house these statues and continue the conversations because I'm a student of history and I just value the past, whether it's bad or good. I think it's to erase one is still not a solution. Um, as you say, right, you tell the whole story. I just wonder how we get past the destruction of these monuments and how we put them in a, in a place where we can have safe conversations. Yeah, you know, so I think that the destruction of the monuments, um, the desire to tear down things, you know, what we call cancel culture, right? It's like, you know, we wanna act like things are just not here or we wanna dismiss it is what happens when the pendulum swings to the other side, if you will, right? And so you go exactly. from, from extreme racism and feelings of absolute and feelings and in, in, in facts in which we can, we, can, we can factually call out exclusion and racist activity to now we're on the other side of the pendulum where it's like, now we want to react. We're making somewhat emotional uh, decisions without the full context. And then we're not thinking about the implications of simply erasing whole parts of our story in order to somehow uh, atone for the atrocities that have been committed. And so I think that the reason why people want the, the, the uh, statues destroyed is because it would, in their mind, stop the celebration or the honoring of these very specific figures. And I can appreciate that. Um, and, and I too believe that some of these figures clearly are um, in need of being revisited in terms of whether or not they should be celebrated. But I agree with you that um, the, these statues, these uh, artifacts can be moved somewhere where they can be preserved. And this story, the narration around them, and this is where museums come in, uh, have the ability to really tell the full story um, and offer that, that complexity to it. I think to get there, we're gonna have to one, acknowledge that the pendulum has swung because with this is, we're, we're talking about years of bubbled up emotion and tension and, you know, when you're talking hundreds of years of people being silenced, right? And their experiences being disregarded and hundreds of years of, of direct marginalization, um, there is a, a period in which folks need to express their anger. And while we may not necessarily agree with it, we can try to understand it. Um, the second piece is um, whenever, and, and this is on whichever side of an argument, um, there is uh, anger that's present. What I try to do as someone who is in these conversations a lot is to listen for what can be validated. So there's a valid position that everyone has. So I want the statue taken down because I don't want this figure celebrated as a valid position to have. And I think someone needs to say that to folks like we get that you don't want celebration of this figure. However, what we don't wanna do is we don't want to participate in muting the narrative and not allowing this, this figure to be offered the complex outlook that it deserves, right? So I think in order to diffuse some of the anger, there's a need for some social validation of where that anger stems from and why it's important to have these discussions. And then third, I would say, is uh, really uh, inviting, like I think this is a role that, uh, that historical societies and museums can take on is facilitating public discussions about some of these controversial figures. Um, I know, for example, in Waterbury, there was a, a statue of Columbus and there was a big um, uh, sort of a, a protest, if you will, with Black Lives Matter and then supporters of the Columbus statue from some other institutions and, and they got into it and ultimately it was diffused. But the historical societies can play a role. And this is where I talk about leadership steps out. Leadership sees conflict as opportunity. Conflict is opportunity for transformation. Conflict is opportunity for learning. Conflict is opportunity for growth. And so the, the role that the historical society can play is saying, let's, let's put together some, some conversations. Let's advocate for these 
uh, statues to be removed and placed in some of these historical places, not to be celebrated, but to be narrated and to have the story told. And so I think there's room for that. And I think if you see more of that type of approach um, that you'll get more reasonable uh, minds and hearts to prevail ultimately. Um, I don't think the answer to, to uh, white supremacy is black supremacy. Those are two different sides of the, the uh, pendulum. But, I, but I, I do think that somewhere in the middle, there's this element of racial equity that says we want all stories told, we want all races treated fairly, and we have to atone for the fact that a large portion of minority communities have been shut out for so long that we need to do, we need to go above and beyond to find and include their perspectives. And so when they call out that something is offensive, Debbie, we've gotta be willing to say, all right, then let's address that head on as opposed to dismiss it as just another angry group trying to get rid of a statue, right? I agree with you. I was, I was also at the place where there's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of shame. Yeah. And so when you acknowledge, sometimes you, you are putting that guilt and that shame on the table and some people can't really handle all of that. Yeah. But anger to me doesn't really get us where we need to be because at the end of the day, we all have to live together. So yeah. the conscious choice for us is to, how do we meet each other where we are? Yeah. Understanding that these are hard conversations. I am frustrated that we are in a time where there's a crisis of leadership, where what we see on Capitol Hill could not prevail in, a, in an ordinary workplace, yeah. where things that are said could not just go unpunished anywhere that I've worked before. Mm -hmm. And therefore, are we healing? Are we really healing or are we still skirting the hard conversations? I think museums really do have an important role to, to be safe places where we can have those hard conversations in an abstract way. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And let me say this, that I, I think to speak to your point about the crisis of leadership, I think that it's, it's the crisis of, of transformative leadership because I think we do have folks that will get in and leverage age old position power to do age old things and operate in the self-interest of some and the disregard for others. I think the need here is for folks to step into a transformative role and recognize that um, you know what's good for all is good for all. We cannot allow um, this idea that we can ignore atrocities against whole groups or uh, dismiss the lived experiences of people and then think that everyone's going to want to have conversations. We've got to do both. We've got to invite you in for a conversation and still be willing to acknowledge in that conversation that there's been some harm done. And I'll go as far as saying this, the United States needs to not only apologize for the atrocities against Black Americans in this country, but they need to atone for it through uh, systemic reparations and, and the inclusion of specific um, economic and political uh, uh, infusions of, of capital and other things to rebalance the scales. You know, better schools, um, you know, access to appropriate housing, uh, reforming the, the prison system. I mean, those are things that to me fit under a systemic reparations package. And this is not about putting, just putting a check in someone's hand and saying, go spend this stimulus money, right? Or, you know, we're gonna stimulate, we're gonna give you this money for everything that ever happened to your people. I'm talking about reforming the system as a whole because I think part of the anger that's, that's there is that there's just been no, uh, there's been no atonement. And so it's really hard to get to a place of reconciliation when there's no atonement. And what folks want in the dialogues is they want mutuality and they want peace and they want us to have rich, meaningful dialogues. And I want that too. But I know that the likelihood of being able to get folks there when they've felt no sense of atonement is very difficult. And that's the challenge you're up against. I still do believe though, that if there's an absence of shared, of, of transformative leadership there, it doesn't need to exist at the museum level and the local level. And that you have the unique position of being able to be the transformative leader in your community to say, we are gonna have those discussions. We are going to address those complex matters. We are going to do our part to tell those, 
those rich stories. And we are not going to just simply support muting whole segments of anyone's history. It's just not the way we work, so. Yeah, thank you, Jamal, and thank you, Debbie. I wanna thank Sarah Griswold for her comment in, in the chat box uh, on this topic as well. And uh, Jeanette Isaac, I'm, I'm coming back to you because you had raised your hand early on and I wanted to honor oh, that. Oh, you know what? That was what by mistake. <laughs> I was trying to adjust right. something. <laughs> well, you, uh, you figured out the raise hand function very well, yes. so. All right, I just want to make sure you had a chance because you were first and I thought I saw Lorraine. Were you down there raising your hand? Go ahead. Hi, Lorraine, you're on mute. There you go. Jamal, thank you so much. I, I, um, something that you uh, mentioned was that you know conflict might be an opportunity. And I thought, well, one of the things that I'm very grateful for, I'm not grateful for COVID, <laughs> But it did give us an opportunity to hit pause on some of our programs. Uh, I know in Wallingford, I'm um, a communications consultant for the Wallingford Historic Preservation Trust. Last June, we were planning on celebrating our 350th uh, Jubilee. And of course, we had programming planned at our two historic homes. And then of course, COVID happened, the George Floyd incident happened, and we hit pause because we thought, wow, you know, there, we really need to make some sort of connection with this. We just couldn't talk about our Puritan ancestors and the European immigrants who helped um, uh, with the silver industry. We had to do something a little bit more. So uh, we decided that both of these homes, since they had some connections to the transatlantic slave trade to discover, to dig deep for a whole, whole uh, range of descendants that we had never acknowledged. Yeah. And um, we were successful in getting a grant from the Cuno Foundation in Meriden uh, to hire someone, a slavery scholar from CCSU to help us put this together. And we've just felt that that's been our contribution during this time. And it, it might not have happened if it hadn't been for COVID. So I, I think it was really an opportunity to look at the programs we were putting forth that were not inclusive and to really broaden them to, to make them more inclusive. And it's, uh, it's, it's almost, uh, a miracle that this really um, made us change direction in a very, I'm hopeful in a very transformative way. So thank you, Jim. Jim. Oh, thank you, Lorraine. And let me say this, I mean, you know, I'm glad that you highlighted that, that COVID um, encouraged a pause in a way and it's in its own kind of way. The other thing that COVID was able to do was just like the George Floyd incident was able to sort of raise the veil, right? To increase awareness around what has been going on in terms of systemic disparities around healthcare and other issues. And it's brought to the forefront how deep the, uh, the, the roots of racism run. And so while we're not happy about COVID and we will never celebrate the loss of, of half a million people uh, to, this, to this pandemic, what we will say is that, and many more around the globe, what we will say is that uh, it has done uh, the work of being able to highlight on the mainstream level how significant these racial and ethnic disparities are in the healthcare system, how health inequity runs. And raising that point as once again, you know, I always say to folks, if we live um, under the veil of, of ignorance and we are unconsciously incompetent, which means we don't know what we don't know, at the point where we now know, where the information is in front of us and we've been told this, we can't not know it. <laughs> <laughs> we, that's a super double negative, right? Like you, 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 you can't just ignore what you know. So once you become conscious, you become aware, your consciousness is elevated, you're responsible for what you know at that point. So I think what COVID in that regard has done is it's elevated some folks awareness. And once again, has led to people saying, I had no idea, but now that I know I'm responsible for what I do with this information. So hopefully to your point, uh, folks have, have been able to see that and they, you know, when they start back up, you will see some difference in the way we're doing things in our healthcare system and our arts and culture sector and other key uh, parts of our communities. 
Very good. I see Sarah Griswold looked like you had your hand up first, and then we'll go to Florence Barlow right after that. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, one of the um, one of the places I work, I do a lot of work around the state, is the Institute for American Indian Studies in Washington, which has, um, and also I'm on the board of the Mary and Eliza Freeman Center in Bridgeport. Um, and um, I am waking up to the histories in every town in Connecticut being, I mean, you know, a lot of our communities think that they have a simple history or a very white history, but there isn't a community in the state of Connecticut that isn't impacted by the, um, the amazing history of Native Americans. And um, I don't believe that there is probably any community that hasn't had, had some black history connected to it. Um, in Washington, Connecticut, where I live, there is this amazing woman named Bathsheba Liberty. And um, in the church record, her father put when she was born and is free. Um, and, um, you know, nobody, she left, she left nothing behind except that really. Um, and that, you know, those stories are really important. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then, you know, the 12,000 12, years of Native American history in our state. Um, it's very important, I believe, to acknowledge that in every single historical society and museum. Um, so that's just, I'm just like, hooray. <laughs> I, yeah. I love what you have to say and it, and it, it works, your, your React model is, is uh, I'd like to know more about it actually, so thanks. Sure. Thank you, and, and, and I'll respond to that by saying this, that, I, that in, as you know, the, the history of um, indigenous folks in this country and the history of, of black folk in this country are so deeply intertwined in terms of how we've had to all deal with um, the, the, uh, the history of racism here, right? The, the issue of racism in this country I, I myself, I'm, I'm Seminole, so my background on my father's side is rooted in, in Florida and, and Seminole Indians who left because of racism and went to the Bahamas and came back. And, you know, uh, the, the, the connection that I learned about between, this, between uh, the Seminoles and Blacks in that area that developed into what they call the Black Indian was that a lot of the indigenous folks in those spaces were actually housing or trying to, you know, were hiding Africans who were on the run. Who were, were trying to provide them with refuge from dealing with uh, with with uh, slave masters, which is really interesting. The other part that I learned is that uh, many of the the um, and and as a result, when they would hide them or give them refuge, some of that that uh, the marriages and other things would happen, and you know, children were born, and I guess that's where my family's line started. But um, one of the other things I learned was that uh, it was difficult for for uh, you know white. Uh, slave masters to really control uh, indigenous folks because they were uh, willing to die for their freedom and were willing to put themselves on the line. And so the use of black bodies and black labor where there was almost no resistance to a degree to the idea of being enslaved when you're bringing them from Africa and you're imposing all this intimidation on them really, um, it, it you know, it, it kind of existed in parallel to this other system in which, you know, you know, you've got indigenous folks that are like, no, we're not going to do that. And then literally provided support and in some kind of, some cases refuge uh, for folks, for, for black folk who were, who were pulled into this madness. So it's really a long, deep story between those communities. And uh, recently within the last year, you've heard more and more folks using the uh, terminology of, of BIPOC, which is black indigenous and people of color. And, and I appreciate that as someone who is black and indigenous, right, by, by root, uh, to know that we are for once acknowledging that um, collectively, not only just black and indigenous folks, but all people of color in this country have been dealing with some real systemic uh, challenges and that we all need to be acknowledged as a part of the solution. Now, let me just say this, that the atrocities, not to play oppression Olympics, but atrocities have been worse for some than others. Um, at the same time, I think it's important that we acknowledge that, um, you know, the non-white population in this country has, has had a hard time and a hard experience and that more and more we're seeing collective action from groups that have been minoritized. So um, it is important. So thank you, Sarah, for, for referencing 
um, the indigenous population. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you. Um, Florence, you're next. And then I have a chat question from Carissa Gold. Sure. Hi, Florence. Florence, you're on mute. Yep. There you go. Jamal, thank you very much. This is very interesting. And as I always say, for such a time as this, in winter, we're getting ready to celebrate our centennial. Uh -huh. And I've always said to people, I've lived in Windsor since 1970. And I always said, you know, it takes a village. And when you talk about history, if you go all the way back to the 1700s, there were people like Sarah was saying with indigenous, with slaves, there have always been people of every color. So I'm working with uh, Agnes Peer. We're getting ready to celebrate our centennial here in Windsor. And we have our five villages, and we'd like to be able to go into neighborhoods, talk to people, and try to get them involved so that we can do a big celebration with all these different diversities. Yeah. Well, here's the tricky part. I don't know if you have an answer to this. We're trying to figure out how do we go down into an area and meet someone or define these people? Do you have a... Yeah, yeah. So, so we get that question a lot because I, I do a lot of work with, um, with, with programs that are trying to go into towns and communities and, and build those relationships. And what I usually tell folks is in every um, community, there are certain people that have trust equity um, that, that are the, the folks that you need to know. And many of those folks are often housed in the, the faith-based institutions. So looking okay. at churches in the community, uh, looking at, at houses of worship, uh, looking at, um, you know, those kind of institutions will oftentimes give you some lead in. The other piece is in certain communities, um, there are certain just, um, you know, community level hotspots, if you will, places where everyone goes, uh, stores that everyone kind of passes through, whether it's the supermarkets in those areas, uh, barbershops, beauty salons, places like that, where if you go in and you ask questions about who you can talk to, they will have an incredible amount of information. And the thing I've learned, uh, Florence, is that people love to be asked. <laughs> they love to be included and they love to be invited and they love to be asked questions about who in the community they can talk to and those kind of things, like really showing that you have a lot of respect for the community and you would like to get to know some folks. But what happens oftentimes is there's usually an apprehension, if you will, to go in and have those conversations. Well, we don't want to offend anyone. We don't, I think your approach is saying, no, we want to go out and meet people is important, uh, but go out and, and build outreach. The other thing is that the schools may know folks. You have, you have community outreach offices, family workers at the schools that may know uh, families and community members that you can also connect with as well. So leveraging partnerships with uh, schools and with organizations that already have trust equity in those communities also gives you an inroads, okay? So it's, it's I'm willing to introduce folks, my folks to you because I know you, right? And I trust you. you, therefore I'm willing to make that introduction. Thank you very much. Sure, no problem. All right, Florence, that was a great question. Thanks so much. And then just for those out there wondering, Windsor is still the oldest town in Connecticut. And the 100th anniversary she's talking about is the anniversary of the establishment of the Historical Society wow. out of the town, just in case you were wondering. All right, so uh, Carissa Gold had a question. Uh, she says, thank you, Jamal. Could you please speak about how to address the equity pipeline of future leadership and employees of color that doesn't trigger appropriation? Okay, I, the, I, you have me until the doesn't trigger appropriation. I wanna understand what your sort of thought pattern was because I want to make sure I'm answering the question correctly. Is that, who, who asked that question? Chris is unmuted. So Chris, she's hi, hi, Chris. Hi, Jamal, you thank you. Yep. Um, so I'm calling from Boulder, Colorado and I'm a faculty at a university in Boulder and we are desperately needing more infusion of faculty of color. Yeah. And the question is, how can we find faculty of color that have gone through the academic track mm -hmm. that um, fulfills the credentials for the university? And so uh, to me, I completely understand the pipeline concept, but if we go all the way back to elementary schools, yeah. how do we 
bring forth that vision without training them to be exactly the way we want them to be. I That's get how I'm saying. using appropriation. Yeah, no, I, I understand it now. And I, and I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it in the both end context because I can appreciate that what you're saying is okay. That's one. That's one avenue. But you obviously don't want to just build them for that one particular purpose. But I think when I'm talking about going back to sort of uh, look at at, at long term pipeline building, it's about the introduction. Like you know, I, I remember, for example, Carissa, like when I was a kid going to school in inner city and like career day, they did not have enough options outside of like maybe four or five. Uh, you know, and they were, they were high profile type positions. Like, do you want to be a police officer? Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want a firefighter? Those kind of things. And I think, I, and I've said this to groups that really, you know, uh, careers are complex. Most of us have bumped into careers we never knew we'd be in, right? And so it's like to be able to have folks to go out and have those kind of conversations early with young people, really about exposing them to the options and the choices and also introducing them, you know, uh, early. A lot of the college programs that I've been affiliated with it, to, to be able to get young folks of color in college, you start early to introduce them to what the campus life and all that could look like and what the rigor could look like. So I think it's, it's similar and what I'm suggesting in terms of pipeline building for employees is that it's about really showing and introducing this idea that this is a possibility for you. Now that doesn't answer the short term uh, question, but it does say in the long term, it helps you to think about systemic pipeline building. But I think this goes back to, to, to sort of the response that I have for Florence, which is that so much of the everyone is trying to build a pipeline right now. You know, uh, folks of color in this country represent a portion of the demographic that eventually will become a majority. But right now, individually, each one of those groups is still a minority group. And so oftentimes when we're trying to diversify, we're dipping into a lot of the same pools, right? And we're, <laughs> into, and we're trying to get to the same folks. So I think what has to happen is there needs to be a, um, an acknowledgement that um, relationships with other groups that already have those elements of connection or trust equity are important in order to be able to identify appropriate people for these types of opportunities. I think that's one piece of it. And I really do believe it's a big part because through those relationships with other schools, other organizations, alumni associations, folks that have that, have that connection, you may be able to get access, additional access to uh, professionals of color who would be interested in what you're doing. And I think, you know, awareness, we'd be surprised at how little people know that there is this, um, there's such an open door for some really great opportunities out there because the door has been closed for so long and the pipeline of communication has been quiet, has been shut for so long to certain communities that I think just at least getting out and doing basic things like community information sessions for professionals, job fairs, uh, doing, doing things that allow folks to know that, you know, yes, we want to bring you into our community and this is why, and this is, this is what we're looking for. And frankly, Carissa, I would even go as far as saying, you know, talking about your values around equity and inclusion and why it's important that you're not just looking for another check mark, but you also are looking to enrich the community. You're looking to enrich the school faculty and that what your hope is, is that this will make your school better. Sometimes the cell is what makes a difference. I, like when I get asked to serve on a board, I'm asking them for what? Are you looking for me to serve on your board because you're looking to, you know, my skin tone, right? Is this, is this a construct issue or are you looking for me to serve on the board because I bring some uh, unique competency that you are craving to have on your board, right? And you're looking for my perspective and strategy and governance. And what I often find is that that stops the conversation because ultimately what they were looking for initially was an opportunity to check the box. And so to move away from the conversation about peer diversity, but focus it on equity and inclusion and how important that is to you as a value, but be substantive in your relationship building and be authentic about what you want to do. Finally, I'd say with any group that's looking to do uh, recruitment and development of, of folks that have multicultural backgrounds, you really want to uh, revisit your standards. And I know that that's a system-wide issue, but so many uh, businesses have to think, what are the standards? It's not, and watch this, I'm not using the terminology lower the standards. What I'm talking about is revisiting the standards to determine what of what you're asking for is a necessary component and what are the things that you're not asking for that could be valuable. So what, what is the role of lived experience versus a certain level of, of college education when we know that there are educational disparities that deny whole communities access to the college and university pipeline. We've got people that are in years and years of debt and they're encouraging folks, don't go to school because you're gonna inquire more debt 
and you'll have no way out. And so when you have those kind of issues that exist and you've got years and years of educational disparities and people are getting educated at different levels, and then you say that this is the standard across the board for entry into our illustrious uh, institution, what you're doing is right there, you're eliminating a segment of the population that could be eligible. So I'm not suggesting to lower the standard because I don't believe that you need to lower it, but I do think you need to revisit it, restructure it, and start to think of what else you value that could be equivalent to some of the core skills that you're looking for and, and have that conversation in a meaningful way so that when you're looking at candidates, you're opening up your lens a bit more. Thank Jamal, you. thank you. I'm so glad to hear you talk about lived experience. You know, there's a whole movement uh, of you know, crediting lived experience, vice academic experience to uh, you know, bring people in. And, and that's certainly something we're looking at here as well as, you know, do you, do you need a person with a master's degree in a particular topic to actually do the work? Or does somebody with a bachelor's degree and some great experience or great training in, in a field suffice? Uh, and can they do a, an equally exceptional job? So, and I also want to say something that Jamal taught me a long time ago when he was describing going into this business. Originally, I think you, and correct me, but you, you were kind of thinking, well, you know, I can be a Rolodex for people that want to find people of color to serve on boards. And then you realize that, no, it's a cultural change that needs to occur, not just a Rolodex, but you'd get people, you know, white led organizations going, there's nobody out there. There's no people of color. And then there's all these people of color going, I never get asked to serve on boards or, you know, that kind of thing. And it's like these Venn diagram circles that never seem to intersect, but there are a lot of great people out there who would love to be involved in organizations. Uh, but they're not seeing something that's attractive uh, in your organization. So what kind of change can we make uh, that will make it more attractive? So anyway. I'm yeah, I think, I think we have to begin to look at people. I, I, I make this a point of practice for myself is that I look at everyone, all of you and anyone I meet as being creative, resourceful and whole. And that's my life philosophy is that everyone has those elements. And so, um, I truly believe that if someone is creative, resourceful, and whole, that they have intrinsically what it takes to be successful. And, and then I have to look at specifically within the context of like my company and things I'm looking for, I have to ask myself, is this person trainable? Are they coachable? If they don't have certain skills, or they have other skills that could be utilized? Uh, and I try to take an asset-based lens and apply that to looking at people. I think so much of, you know, when I was a recruiter years back, I was a corporate recruiter for a very short period of time though. Uh, one of the things that we were trained in was how to look for knockout factors, to look at all the reasons to kick people out of a process, to eliminate them from the process. And I think we have to actually turn that around and start looking for inclusion factors. What are the things that we could in, in, in we could use that bring people in, uh, elements of their background, their experience, their academics, and so forth, that will help them uh, to be a part of this. Are they coachable? Are they trainable? Uh, yes, they may not be necessarily polished. And what is one of the things we hear about, you know, people want polished folks and all that, but polished by whose standard? And, and when they bring them, in, when you bring them in, are they coachable? Can you bring them to the level that you need in order for them to be successful at the job, not to necessarily assimilate into the culture? but to be successful in the role and will they bring value for everyone else? Can everyone else adjust, right? Can everyone else in the workforce adjust to someone who's different being brought on board? These are really critical questions, but very important ones to ask when you're doing that kind of uh, work. Awesome, yeah, I've got just two more then we'll have to wrap up here. Um, I have a comment from Jim Welsh and I can see he's got my very favorite line in the world. He says, in disability rights, we have a saying, nothing about us without us. That's an important to keep in mind at our decision points, evaluating policies and hiring. I love that. That is uh, equally applicable to history organizations as well. And then Liz Burke has her hand up. So I'd like to ask Liz to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Well, I was at the university um, in a grad program for 11 years. And one of the things where I think we really failed was not in seeing uh, what you, you, Jamal, referred to as the creative side. We it turned out after I was in touch with grad students who had suffered through our grueling program, we found out that a whole number of them had these amazing talents that we never learned a thing about. We didn't know that there were phenomenal singers <clears throat> who were singing at our students' weddings 
and we didn't know that there were artists. We didn't know um, one of my one of my former students has recorded. Well, two of them have recorded CDs. All these things we never knew about them. The program was so rigorous. We sort of wiped out their humanity in many ways. And I've been so sorry about that because that's what has made them magnificent. One of the singers um, is now a, a phenomenal expert at Johns Hopkins. And one of the things she does is go to all these um, medical demonstrations where they put a, a scope down her throat and she sings while they watch her vocal cords. But that's just a little side feature of her phenomenal singing ability. And I think our program absolutely shut out. Um, one of my students was a, a, a Pentecostal and Hispanic and invited me to the um, church where she gave her debut of her CD. And I was just sorrowful that we never knew that in grad school. Another one was an Orthodox Jew in New York City where we went to her wedding and experienced a whole new world, none of which we knew about. And I think these programs that deny the creativity in people over the rigor of the program are missing this huge element about what makes somebody good. Liz, I couldn't agree more. I just want to, I know we're getting ready to close, but I want to I speak to what you just said. Um, I pulled up one of my notes here from Brene Brown, who said that dehumanizing others is the process by which we become accepting of violations against human nature, the human spirit, and for many of us, violations against the central tenets of our faith. Mm -hmm. um, and so dehumanization becomes a core tool in racism, essentially, that we leverage this power to take away people's humanity and we justify it. Um, and ultimately, to your point, we've got to start rehumanizing and really allowing ourselves to see people as, as their whole selves and not just putting them in this social construct or box that fits what our dominant culture ethos says is yeah. um, the right thing or the right person. So I really greatly appreciate that. And I always appreciate an opportunity to reference Brene Brown. That's my girl, she's on point with it. So thank you for, for sharing that. Well, Joelle, that's a great point to end on. I wish we could keep going for questions and discussion because I'm sure others have them, but uh, I just want to say, uh, so sincerely, Jamal, thank you. You have been generous with all of your time today and many, many other times with us and really helped our organization a lot. And uh, if by some small way, this gives a little more platform to Minority Inclusion Project and Thought Partner Solutions, well, then that's good too, right? Uh, Jamal has said he will send us, the, he'll send me the PowerPoint slides that kind of reinforce some of the points he made today. And I'll send them out to everybody. Uh, so you can have those if you want a, a takeaway or something to reflect on later with some of the key points, uh, particularly about his process that he's talked about. Um, so again, thank you all, everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Sue, who's been very quietly at dealing with some of our challenges, people trying to get in and out of the call and letting people in, much appreciated, Sue. Uh, we have one more virtual history program coming up this winter. Uh, it is featuring popular Yukon historian Fiona Bernal speaking about how we are all responsible for promoting inclusion in the collecting and telling of historical narratives. And she has done a lot of collecting and telling of historical narratives in our region. So she will have a lot of great examples to share about oral histories that she has done, uh, particularly with the West Indian population, but many others. Uh, in our area. So I think uh, you'll find that very interesting. That's on April 15th. I hope you will join us. And so again, from Windsor, Connecticut, Connecticut's first town, thank you all for being here. I had to say that because Jamal and I both live in Wethersfield. So, <laughs> so thank you all for joining us and good night to everybody. All right, good night. Thanks. Thanks.